our last speaker of the session, Grace Ehoshe, will be presenting some results from her PhD in plant breeding and genetics, which she did a few years back at Massey University, in collaboration with Ag Research based at Palmerston North. She has gone on to continue in the same field and is currently a plant breeder with PGG Rights and Seeds based out of the Manawatu. Welcome, Grace. Thank you, Laura. Hello, everyone. Just familiarize myself with this. Um, all right, so white clover is a fundamental part of many pastures in New Zealand um, due to the fact that it can provide all year round good quality feed for livestock, as well as the all important nitrogen fixation, um, which has been talked about um, earlier on. Um, Despite the fact that white clover breeding has been historically successful with many amazing cultivars released, it's not without its challenges. Some of these challenges include the fact that many of the traits are quantitative in nature, so that means they're under the influence of many genes, and that just means that translates to difficulty or challenging trait improvement. Also, many of these traits are assessed in mixed soil, so it's grown in with a companion grass, usually ryegrass. Um, and so when you want to assess or phenotype your, your trials, you're going to face challenges, especially with trying to get dramate yield or stolon density or other, other, other traits of interest. Another um, significant issue is GBAE, which is that interplay between the gene and the environment and also management practices as well. So many of white clover traits are influenced significantly by GBAE. And um, usually you have that in the worst form, which is when you have that crossover. So there's a re-ranking of genotypes across sites because that just um, hinders you from identifying superior lines in your trials. So all of these problems lead to um, long generation intervals in white clover breeding. So it takes, what, 10 to 15 years, and that's more cost, quite expensive for um, breeding programs and a long time for new cultivar release as well. Um, genomic selection is a tool that can help solve some of these issues. Um, I guess the five-minute pitch, a five-second pitch for genomic selection is that you're trying to use DNA information to predict field performance. And how you do this is that you have a training population that you're going to genotype and phenotype and estimate marker effects in that population. And then you um, put that in a black box, which is your GS model. And from that, you can then run um, the genotype or the DNA information of um, individuals that you have no phenotype and then get an estimate of their breeding value. So that's how good the merit of that individual. And in doing so, you are able to save time because you're able to select at the seedling stage and you're able to address other components of the breeder's equation and increase your genetic gain. Because if you're able to cut time in half, you're going to double your genetic gain automatically. So that's a win. And you're also able to increase your selection intensity by the expanded capacity to screen more individuals as well. Um, so the two pieces of information that you need, your genotype information and your phenotype, uh, we got this, we had our two, uh, our, our trial, um, our trials in two locations, um, a multi-year multi and two location field trial. Um, we got the DNA from 200 parents, um, and then we identified our SNPs by GBS pipeline, which is a relatively cheap, fast way to get a whole lot of SNPs quite quickly. Um, and then we have we, we genotype the we phenotype the progeny, the 200 um, progeny, and got very important traits that we are interested in. Um, we're speaking to dry matter yield today. These two pieces of information were fit in our genomic prediction model and I'll be presenting the results. Um, so our crossing scheme was an among and within family selection method. Um, the lack of using within family um, selection has been one of the banes of breeding, I think, and it has, has reduced the amount of genetic gain that we've been able to achieve in forages. So this method, using genomic selection, we're able to ac access the within family variation that's really important for breeding. So we used uh, a phenotype of selection to do the 10, at the 10 percent selection intensity and selected the top 20 families for high dry matter yield, and that forms the among family approach. From those families, we then took 20 plants from each and then genotyped those lines 
and then estimated their GE babies, and then selected one plant from each of those 20 families. That's a 20 plant polycross, and that formed the genomic selection approach, which is the AW part there. And then we also just randomly sampled from those 20 um, families, just one plant, to form the conventional breeding strategy, that's the HSP or the conventional breeding here. So our results, um, the first, the box plot just presents the GEBBs, the estimated breeding values. This is the base population over here. And then the next is the um, conventional approach. And then the, the, the third is the genomic selection approach. And you can see that it's, 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 it's a lot higher when you use genomic selection. Your GEBBs, you tend to have, we, we got pretty much more than double in terms of the percentage increase relative to the base population for genomic selection. Um, the response to selection, which is a difference in the performance from the parents as well was also higher using genomic selection as compared to the conventional method. So to conclude, um, genetic gain was realized with both approaches, and that's also, also important to remember that genomic selection can be used alongside conventional breeding to help you increase that genetic gain, which was double using genomic selection as compared to the conventional method. And it also helps us to allow, also allows us access that within family variation. And then also mentioned that selections are currently being empirically validated in multi-site field trials. And that's it, so thank you. I'll just quickly mention the, um, the sponsors, it's PG Plus, um, which is a joint venture co-funded by Dairy NZ, Beef and Lamb, Grasslands Innovation, Ag Research, MPI, Vigorizing Seeds, Berenberg, and yeah, Dairy Australia. Thank you so much. <laughs>